Hey everyone, welcome to the first video of many for my new hotel acquisition model. Uh, in this video particularly, I'm going to give you a brief overview and we're going to dive into the summary tab. Uh, so I'm really excited about this model. It's taken me a while uh, to go through. Um, there's a lot of really cool features and it gets really in-depth. You can do everything from a you know quick back of the envelope analysis where you can actually go really into detail uh, analyzing a certain hotel asset. So just to start, um, as you can see at the bottom here, this contains eight tabs, one of which is the cover, which we're looking at now. Um, this will be updated periodically. It may not look the same when I actually upload the model when I complete this video. Um, this is really uh, similar to all adventures in CRE models where we give updates when the version's been updated or any relevant links are all posted up at this front page. Um, so the second page here, we have our summary. And this is the, the main focus of this video, but I'll briefly go through all the other uh, tabs and then we'll come back to this. Here we have our uh, high level cash flow summary where we've rolled up all of our uh, detailed cash flows from the tab that we'll look at next. Um, additionally, on this tab, we have a couple of um, metrics that we look at on an annual basis, such as the free and clear return, uh, the cash on cash return. Uh, the debt service coverage ratio and the debt yield, um, all of which we will go over in a future video. In the next tab or the next worksheet, here's where we get into the real crux of, uh, of the hotel pro forma. Here's all the cash flow, all the details of, of all the different line items. And again, this will be explained in a future video. We have our F and B tab where we put in all our assumptions for our F and B options. Um, other operating departments, other expenses, and finally our penetration analysis where we compare this asset to other comps. All right, so uh, let's dive into the summary tab. So I'm going to go over this. Um, I'm going to go over each box, really. I'm just going to go down, and then I'm going to head over to the right. Um, so the first box, general info and timing, uh, here's where you put in um, – you know, your, your basic property info, the name, the address, uh, city and state, and what version this is. Now, as I update versions, I'm going to change this number from 1.0 to whatever the future version will be. Um, you, however, if you're using this for, you know, looking at investment opportunities as, as you're updating this and sharing with third parties, you should, you should be updating this accordingly as well. Um, below that, we have um, how many hotel rooms or hotel keys. And then under that, we have our acquisition start. Now, the way you work this is you basically put in a, a month below here in cell C11. Uh, and uh, there's a, a drop-down menu which you can select, you know, 1 through 12. And then below that in C12, you put in your, your uh, year. Um, and like, you know, with all our models, and this is a really basic principle for real estate financial modeling, as you update this, this will update... Um, the pro formas accordingly. So we start in April, so April 2019, so you'll see that this is year ending March 2020. As you can see that as well here on our cash flow summary tab. So as you update this, this will be updating uh, the other, the other uh, worksheets. And so below that we have our, our hold period and here you can hold up to, uh, so here you can hold your investment um, anywhere from one to 10 years. And as you update uh, your whole period, uh, you will notice on both the uh, cash flow summary tab and the operating cash flows that um, these will change accordingly. Basically, the years past your analysis will uh, gray out. And this is helpful if you want to share these sheets with third parties. If you want to print them out. You won't have extra years and have to tell people, oh, you know, we're only holding this for certain years. It will actually just show it. Um, so, for example, let's say we're holding this for, let's say we're holding this particular investment for three years. You'll see now the cash flow summary goes to three years, and then our um, our operating cash flow goes to three years with our reversion year at four. And notice that it's here, but it's grayed out. And the reason this is showing up is because we used the year after sale um, to uh, get to an exit value for our property. Okay, so that is um, a summary of the general info and timing section. 
All right, so let's move on to the acquisition assumptions section. Okay, so here you have the ability to uh, derive a purchase price using three methods. Uh, the first method is by using a discount rate on the cash flows. Um, the second one is using a cap rate on year one and Y, and then the third option is um, using a custom input. So I'm not going to go into detail about um, the discount rate or uh, the cap rate. If you're unfamiliar, we have a couple posts about these two topics. Um, on adventuresinstereo.com, and I can link to those in the description if you're unfamiliar. Okay, so below um, the purchase price section, um, we have the acquisitions, the acquisition costs, and we're not including the lender's fees here, so it's everything outside of the lender's fees. And then below that, we have our, our actual lender's fees, which we will come up with in the section below the financing assumptions. And then taking um, you know, all of these, the purchase price, the acquisition costs, and lender's fees, we come up with our all-in basis. All right, and so below our acquisitions assumptions, we have our financing assumptions. Um, and we can just uh, breeze through this pretty fast. We have our loan amount, uh, which is based on our loan to value. Um, we have our interest rate calculation, the loan fees, which is where we came up with this number, this $358,000 number. Um, we have the ability to uh, do interest only periods um, up to whatever the, the hold period is, the amortization period, um, and then the term. And so below that are some of the outputs. So our loan dispersal amount, which is the loan amount less the lender's fees. We have our interest only payments, um, our amortization payments, and then the loan balance repayment upon exit. And looking at this now, I'm noticing an error. Um, because our loan balance repayment um, in this example is larger than our loan amount. So I will um, quickly stop the video and fix this and be right back. All right, so we have now uh, fixed the formula. Um, so now you can see the loan balance repayment is equal to the loan amount. Um, and the reason that is is because we have an interest-only period of four years and a whole period of three years. So... Um, none of the principal has been paid down. And, you know, for another video, we can talk about um, the issues with prepaying your loan early. There are usually fees or penalties. But, you know, if you're going to put this in the model and you happen to be, you know, messing around with the hold periods, but your, your interest only period is longer, the model will, will calculate correctly and you, you'll still have the right answer now for the loan uh, or the loan balance repayment, I should say. Okay, so moving on to exit assumptions. Um, here we have the sale price, which is derived from our uh, exit cap rate. And as I mentioned earlier, um, in the operating cash flow uh, worksheet, we use the reversion year, which is year four. Um, we use this year's NOI and divide that by the exit cap rate. Uh, to derive our $85.4 million sale price. And then below that, we have um, our sales expense at 3%. And then at the bottom of this uh, section, we see both our unlevered proceeds and our levered proceeds from the sale. All right, moving to the right, um, we have our property level return metrics, both unlevered and levered. Um, we have our IRR, our multiple uninvested capital, or um, which is also known as the equity multiple. We have our total cash invested, our total revenue, and our total profit. Uh, below that is the average free and clear return. Uh, for the levered return metrics, they're all the same, except instead of the average free and clear return, we have the average uh, cash on cash return. It's basically the same as the free and clear return. Uh, the free and clear return is really um, just the cash flow from operations divided by um, the purchase price of the asset, whereas the average cash on cash return is the cash flow from operations less the debt service um, divided by the equity that was put in uh, at the time of the acquisition. And actually, really briefly, we can show you um, we have our free and clear return here, which is, uh, as you can see here, it's a cash flow from operations divided by the the uh, acquisition costs without any debt and then the cash on cash is our cash flow from operations less the debt service divided by the uh, 
the equity that was put in um, at the time of the acquisition. All right, and below um, this section, we have our property metrics. This shows um, the purchase price per key, as well as the total amount. It shows the purchase price, the all-in basis, which, again, as we said before, is basically the purchase price plus acquisition costs, including the lender's fees as well, and the all-in basis less uh, debt. Um, so we'll look to compare that to our exit values. So we have our exit sale price, um, and then we have our net sales proceeds, unlevered and levered, repeated in this section. Uh, below this, we have our debt metrics. So we have our minimum debt service coverage ratio, which uh, you know lenders will want to see. And we have our um, minimum debt yield. And just as um, a side note, any of these vocab terms that you're seeing here um, or, or these common um, metrics that we use if, if you're unfamiliar with them you can go to the adventures in CRE glossary um, which we have and all of these um, along with their definitions are, are in there all right so moving on uh, this is really a unique section to a hotel um, underwriting. No other asset really looks at a penetration analysis. And we'll go into this a bit more when we get into the, the uh, penetration tab. Uh, but for now, we can just discuss it in, in a high level overview. So basically, what you're looking at is how this property compares to the competitive set. Um, so the first column here. We're showing occupancy. So compared to this property's competitive set, we're only achieving 78.7% of the occupancy that all of the other, all of the competition is getting. So level set would be 100%. If you're below that, you're underperforming. And if you're over that, you're outperforming your competitive set. So here you can see as the years go on, it's, you know, it drops to 66. What's going on here? Maybe there's this, just by looking at this seems to be, you know, maybe they're doing some sort of repositioning um, because the number drops and maybe there's some sort of major, uh, you know, capital improvement project going on. And not only do the numbers say this, but I actually kind of know this as I sort of built this out. So, uh, you know, that is sort of the implication of what's happening here. Um, year three, it wraps up and you can see that occupancy kicks up and starts to outperform the market. And the same goes with the, you know, average daily rate. As you can see, this, this particular property was out competing when it came to, you know, getting the, the rates on the rooms pretty much all the way through. Um, but when you go to revenue per available room, even though the ADR was, uh, overperforming because the occupancy was so low, the average revenue per available room was low. Um, was lower than the competitive set. And again, you can learn more about um, these uh, this hotel-specific vocabulary, such as you know ADR and RevPAR in our glossary, uh, if you're not already familiar. All right, so um, moving on, we have our property-level returns, and I apologize, I haven't gotten to this piece of this model yet. Um, this was uh, a rather in-depth in and very detailed model so I just wanted to get it out and I just haven't had the time really to, to continue and put in a waterfall or anything so coming soon um, and then finally here we're going we show our year one summary and this breaks down um, each section at a high level um, and we look at it in, in context of, in context of the total uh, asset and then we'll look at it on a per occupied room basis in year one and then uh, breaking it down on a per available room in year one. Um, and then if you go to read on the post, this is you know how a typical hotel performance set up. You'll notice that it's a little, or it's it's very different, honestly, than than a traditional commercial real estate financial model. Um, and I actually have a side post that's put together, and it's already um, live on Adventures in Sierra, which you can go and, and read more about the the typical hotel uh, pro forma and how it's set up or how the cash flow portion of the pro forma is set up. All right, so this is um, 
the conclusion of video one where we went through the summary tab. Um, and stay tuned for the, the following videos that go into more detail about this model. Thanks.